Welcome to the July Forum. I'm Lori Mueller. I'm a member of the Sea Ranch Forum Steering Committee. And I'm going to read you a statement about the Sea Ranch Forum. The Sea Ranch Forum Committee is an independent group, not an official part of the Sea Ranch Association. And our goal is to present forums that are relevant to life on the Sea Ranch. In many cases, our interests run parallel with the communication interests of TSRA committees or the design committee, and we cooperate with those groups in presenting forums. However, we feel our greatest value to the Sea Ranch is in presenting information outside the formalities of TSRA or the design committee. We usually meet uh, the first Saturday from 3 to 5. This month is an exception because of the July 4th activities. Uh, we reserve the first hour for the presentation. We take a short break around 4 and then we return with questions the second hour. Today's forum is being videotaped, so please be aware of the camera. Um, that doesn't mean to get in front of it in way. Um, before we begin today's forum, we make a few pieces of necessary information. The exits are um, to my right, there are two exits, um, and the restrooms are directly uh, uh, along the corridor from the, pat the back exit outside in the next building. And this is also an opportunity for anyone who would like to make an announcement. Is there anyone who has an announcement? Uh, if not, we will proceed with our today's forum. Today our panelists are going to talk about selecting plants around your home. They'll discuss the TSR guidelines regarding landscaping, which plants are appropriate for your particular location, and how you go about designing or modifying your landscaping. The discussion today will feature the new demonstration garden, which has been developed by TSR volunteers to help you select plants for your home. Our panelists today are Nancy Power, who will be the moderator of the panel, and she's a master gardener who is a certified master gardener and has worked extensively on the garden committee, the Del Mar Garden League, and in landscaping the cha chapel. And she started the demonstration garden of native plants at the Sea Ranch. Uh, next to her is Lynn Tuft, who is also a master gardener and former operator of the landscape design business for several years and very active in the California Native Plant Society. She currently serves as a board member of our local chapter. Next to her is Scott Graff, uh, who does planning, design, construction, and maintenance of landscapes and is the former operator of a landscape business in the East Bay. He uh, owns a, a landscaping business here called Floriferous Landscaping. And he uses, he emphasizes the use of native plants in landscape design. He's also a demonstration garden volunteer, as is Lynn. Uh, next uh, to Scott is Bill Wiemeyer, who is the Director of Compliance and Environmental Management at the Sea Ranch, and he is responsible for landscaping uh, policy uh, direction and uh, approvals. And with that, I'm going to turn over um, the forum to Nancy Power. Thank you, Lori. I can't believe I'm nervous. I can do this for a living every day. I shouldn't be nervous. All right, I think I'd first like to introduce some of our other demonstration garden volunteers who are here today. Uh, in the back, helping with the zone identification, is Roz Bray and Cecilia Walter. And we thank them for helping us. They're going to be back there on the break and after the forum. So if you have not yet found out in which zone your property is, uh, they will do that for you. Okay, I think we have a couple of other uh, volunteers. Uh, Elaine Mahaffey is here someplace. There's Elaine. She's one of our demonstration garden volunteers. And let's see, who else do we have? Uh, Jamie Edwards, I believe, is here. Jamie? Okay, anybody else from the garden? Oh, there it is. Okay. All right, we're talking about uh, two different topics today, but certainly they're related. 
uh, one of them being the demonstration garden, which we're in the process of uh, trying to complete. Now, the demonstration garden isn't going to be an entity in and of itself. Uh, we're basically trying to educate property owners on the proper landscaping of their lots how to add plants to your lot, how to redo your landscaping, when you need to get approval. The demonstration garden is simply a tool in that process of educating the property owners. All right, the demo garden is located uh, at the Olson Ranch Center. It's immediately south of the ranch house. So if you've been down to the Olson Ranch Center and visited the library, then right the next lot over from the garden on the library side is the demonstration garden. And even though we're not complete, you're welcome to go and walk through it. All the plants are labeled, plant groups are labeled. Uh, you might see some labels and nothing there. And we did have a bit of a bad winter and we had a flood and some of the plants actually drowned. But we've had some other unexplained fatalities, unfortunately. But we're waiting until fall to replant. We don't want to replant this time of the year. So um, there are still things to see. There's some plants that you might not have seen before on the Sea Ranch, and that's sort of fun. We have uh, gum plants, which are doing wonderfully. They're already about that big, and some people may have never seen one of those. Uh, one of the things I've learned in getting the demonstration garden going is that you do not necessarily have to go out and buy these plants. For example, this is my little prize here. This is it's very small, but that is a huckleberry. And what I did, I went to my front yard, and I just clipped pieces of the huckleberry and stuck them in a planting mix and started watering them, and it grew. So there are ways to start the native plants without having to go and purchase them from the nurseries. All right, um, we're going to be taking questions later, so if you have any other questions on the demonstration garden, you can ask at that time. Plus, Lynn is going to tell us more about that. Now, one of the things that we want to stress is why are we using natives here? Why are we encouraging that and, and not allowing people to put exotics out in front of their house? We agreed when we all moved here that we wanted to live lightly with the land. And we don't want Sea Ranch to look like suburbia. So we don't want lawns, we don't want exotic plants, we don't want formal gardens. Uh, you can put those types of things, the exotics, etc., in your enclosed patio, which I'm sure everybody knows that. But not out in front of the house, not in your side yard, and not any place where you're not enclosed. Um, an example of some of the plants that you may see here and there but are not really permitted. Daffodils. Now we know that we have neighbors who have daffodils. Not okay. Uh, same with naked ladies. Naked ladies are somewhat of a historic tradition at the coast, but they're not native to Sea Ranch and they're not on our approved list. Um, another example would be lawns. You know, cut your grass for fire safety. But don't fertilize it, don't water it, don't cut it real short so it looks like a, a grass in uh, a lawn in suburbia. Um, while I'm mentioning this, I want to stress the fact that we do have two historic gardens here. The Del Mar Garden right here is one of them. The Olson Garden immediately around the house at the Olson Ranch Center is the other historic garden. Now, those are exceptions to the rules. Some of these plants are allowed there because of their being historic gardens. And the cow lilies, the naked ladies, were planted by the ranchers years ago. All right, I think I'm up to introducing uh, Lynn Tuft, who's now going to talk more about the different zones and the plants in those zones. I, uh, wow. Well. Uh, I'm going to give an explanation of the ecological zones. Um, this isn't my forte, but I hope I do okay. Bill Meyer is really the one that knows about this, but I'm going to do my best. 
Since its inception, the Sea Ranch Association has studied the various climates of the Sea Ranch, and as a result, six climate zones were identified and classified. As part of the analysis, Sea Ranch identified indigenous and native plants for each zone. For your information, you can find the, uh, uh, all of the Sea Ranch Association, oh, is it? Sea Ranch Association um, plants by zone by going to the Association West website at www.tsra.org. And then you go to other information uh, where you'll find environment. And under that, you'll find the six zones, uh, their entire vegetative, vegetative list under indigenous and naturalized species. Um, I should qualify this. <coughs> uh, these plants on these zones are generally acceptable, but they are subject to approval by the uh, planning and design departments. Uh, the zones on the Sea Ranch range from the salt spray zone on the ocean bluffs to the upland forest zone on the hilltop ridge. Technically, there are six vegetation zones, but for the demonstration uh, garden purposes, I will talk about four of them, since this is how the demonstration garden is set up. The reason for consolidating the two zones is that the upper terrace and upland forest are similar and tend to overlap in <coughs> vegetation, <coughs> and the dune zone where the vegetation is more limited, the soils are sandier, and the winds typically stronger, is located in the northern part of the Sea Ranch, and is part of the salt spray zone. So those two have been sort of consolidated. The plants in the four zones of the demonstration garden are basically labeled by grouping, uh, such as the sea thrift, um, which is grouped together and located in the salt spray zone. That's one example. Uh, there's a demonstration garden plant list, info list, uh, by zone on the, I believe on the back table, and a map of the sea ranch streets and units showing location of the zones by color code. I think that's fairly new, and I think Ross Bray in the back has some of those available. You should really look at those so you know where you are and what zones apply to your particular uh, unit. In the future, we'll have these lists and maps um, available at the demonstration garden. Next, I'm going to give a brief description of each zone represented in the demonstration garden. And I might add that we've not included um, all of the vegetation for each zone that is in the uh, Sea Ranch list. Uh, but the garden does offer a very good sampling, I think. The salt spray zone is located <clears throat> close to or on the ocean bluffs and is battered by the wind and sea, as I will attest to after walking it yesterday. <laughs> this zone is very fragile, particularly close to the bluffs. Um, cypress and other natives basically hold the bluffs together. The lower terrace zone, which is where I live, is found primarily in the meadows, inland from the bluffs, and which at one time was uh, grazing land. It's subdivided by the, by the cypress hedgerows. The landscape is generally low and gently undulates. The meadow in the lower terrace is more defined by riparian corridors and seasonal streams. Some are lined with willows. We're all familiar with those. In short, I think it's a wetland. Also, the lower terrace is affected by winds, uh, depending on your uh, location or exposure in the meadow. Um, there are lots of, I call them microclimates, in between the hedgerows. Um, the closer you are to the hedgerow, maybe the more protected you are, uh, you can grow different vegetation uh, that's, well, it just does better. Um, the planting's growth can be shaped or affected um, by this environment. Um, so, it's, it's a, the lower terrace zone it covers, there's quite, quite a bit of the Sea Ranch on the western side uh, of, the, of Highway 1. 
The terrace break zone is a transitional zone on either side of Highway 1. And when we drive on Highway 1, it's clearly what grows there. I mean, it's, the, the topography is steeper, <clears throat> the land form is irregular, and stream channels shape the land area. The landscape is more varied, more trees, and massive masses of uh, native shrubs such as the wax myrtle, uh, coffee berry, ceanothus, western azalea, you know, pines, we even have a drone. Uh, generally speaking, it's not as open and there's lighter wind. Uh, upper terrace zone <clears throat> is marked by less ocean influence, sometimes warmer in summer and less wind. And I can sort of speak to that. Um, I lived in the upper terrace up near a uh, schooner on Ramsworn Reach for a while, and it was definitely very different while we were building our house down in Unit 28 <laughs> when I would come down and visit uh, during the summer. In many places, the zone is mixed streams with riparian vegetation, such as sedges, iris, and other forbs, uh, and penetration of upland forests blend together. Uh, basically, I talked just about the zones. Uh, I didn't talk about individual plantings, but during the question uh, and answer session, if you have questions at all about the different zones and what plants, I'll be glad to answer those questions, and I will also be here after this is over. Thank you. Hello, I'm Scott Graff, local landscape contractor and designer. I'm going to talk to you about uh, the demonstration garden, how it's going to evolve, what it will be, uh, how to use the demonstration garden for your own personal uses around your home, uh, and how to create a landscape plan that is that can be submitted to the association for approval, doing the whole process sort of correctly. Um, about the evolution, as all gardens are in landscapes, they're perpetual works of, in progress, ever changing and ever delighting, and the demonstration garden is no exception. A visit to the demonstration garden today, you will easily understand how it's laid out, as Lynn has described, uh, seeing well-labeled, though juvenile plants um, in each zone. As Nancy mentioned, the exceptional wet winter that we've just come out of uh, took its toll on the garden. We've learned some lessons from that, and uh, in the coming months, the volunteers and Sea Ranch staff, uh, facility staff, will be making some adjustments uh, to deal with what we learned, as well as adding some plans to improve what we have already started. In time, what the garden will be, the true beauty and utility of it, will be revealed. Uh, as the plantings grow and establish uh, the form and the features of each plant will become more visible. So uh, from season to season and year to year, it will change such that offering the visitor something new to experience each time. Uh, it's in that process of the garden evolution that we hope you, the Sea Ranch members, will uh, uh, come to visit the garden and observe uh, these Sea Ranch approved plants in their suit, in their, in what am I saying here? In the plantings suitable to your particular zone. Uh, doing so will enable you to make informed and hopefully inspired decisions about choosing plants to use in the landscape around your home. Once you've made those decisions or gained that inspiration, it, you do need to do a submittal to the association, um, which. Uh, it's important to remember, you need to do this before you plan. And I'm here to tell you that it is not as complicated as that may sound. The, the association makes it relatively simple and streamlined. Uh, if you don't already have one, the design department can give you a copy uh, of your individual plot plan for the cost of reproducing that plan. Uh, on that plan, you can, you can then simply illustrate the location and species of plants you would like to use around your home. Uh, example of these sort of acceptable plans we have, I believe, on the back table. Uh, and um, 
with that plan, you do need to do a simple one-page application, also samples of which we have back there, where you briefly describe your intent. Um, and uh, most plans are reviewed on a staff level. Um, depends. Uh, larger ones will often require design committee approval. Um, with the uh, with the design. The turnaround on those uh, applications is fairly quick, typically a couple of weeks. Occasionally a staff member, um, frequently they will make a visit to the site and discuss with you your intent and help you address the issues you're trying to address. Um, so with an approved plan in hand, you're able to go. Um, we have here, I believe in the back also, a list of resources of nurseries in the area. Uh, where you can obtain these native plants. They're not always available at your typical, they're definitely not available at Home Depot, and not often available at your typical home nursery. Um, so there's a list of those uh, great nurseries and resources and online uh, sources, as well as even resources of people who can help you do it, or even do it for you. Uh, in the coming months, uh, we have a couple workshops planned uh, to make this whole thing even easier. One is on selecting the plants and actually developing these plants, helping you do so, helping you through that process. Um, and then, as important, probably even more important to a lot of people, is uh, a workshop on caring for and maintaining your Sea Ranch native garden. It's not your typical sort of mode of situation. You want to keep it looking natural and not sculpt it. So we'll be doing a workshop on how to maintain these plants. I think we're having this one in the fall. Uh, both workshops, if we have good interest, we hope to do uh, perhaps annually because these are issues that never go away. Gardens are always changing and always need maintenance. Um, so we certainly hope you uh, take the time to stop by the garden soon and uh, keep coming back to see something interesting and then perhaps volunteer because we're always looking for helpers to join in the task of maintaining that garden there. So uh, with that, that is Turn it over to Bill. He can tell you a bit more about the association point. <coughs> I'm Bill Weimeyer, a member of the Design Committee staff. Um, as Scott suggests, there is an application form, as there is just about for everything we do here at the Sea Ranch. So, but landscaping is part of that, and there is a form specific to that, and we do require a, a planting plan along with that. Now, that planting plan can vary greatly from if you're doing an extensive design to something simple. And usually, what people do here is simple, because after all, the landscape out there is something that is simple and we, we do not like to see uh, volumes of plant material where you wouldn't normally expect them in this natural environment. So most of what we see are very simple kinds of plants. And uh, Scott covered one part of it. There's a, there is a, a review process. It usually takes about two to four weeks depending on the staff load at that particular time. Sometimes we can turn it around even faster depending on what you want to do. There are occasions where I have simply taken somebody's site plan from their building file and did a couple of circles on there and planted some plants. That's one way of handling it. It can be very simple or it can be rather complex depending on what your program needs are. Um, fees. Generally there are no fees because most of what we review is re relatively simple and it doesn't take a lot of staff time to do. If we take a planting plan to the design committee for review, then there is typically a fee for that. It's $180. Um, let's see. What do we look for? It, some of the issues have already been referred to by the other folks here. Um, simplicity certainly is one. Informality. What we're not, what we're looking for is uh, not suburban solutions, urban solution. Not rows of plants. If if you're going to plant some plants, don't put them right in a row. They should be clustered. What what does nature do when it plants something? 
We're looking for informality, diversity also. Typically, uh, in nature, you're not going to see a large group of one si single species. That's not always true, as we know from what pines do after a fire. But, for the most part, you're going to see diversity in the landscape, and that's what we're looking for as well. We're trying to reflect what's already here in the landscape around your homes. Uh, advice I often give to folks is, Look around your neighborhood. What's growing there naturally? Those are the kind of species perhaps you should be using in your particular landscape to meet your particular program needs, which may be uh, privacy screening, uh, windscreen, uh, color, that sort of thing. Another thing we're not looking for is a, a lot of color in one particular spot. That's something you should try to avoid because you don't normally see that often in nature either. Um, let's see what else. Um, part of a landscape can be something else besides just plants as well. Oftentimes people uh, include as part of a landscape plan uh, solutions for, for burning, for example, or retaining walls. What kind of materials do you use for your retaining walls, for example? There's a number of materials you could use. If, if, you happen to be in an area where there's rock outcrops, for example, and you need a retaining wall. Maybe rocks are appropriate in that particular setting because there are rocks in the natural environment. If you're up in the woods, it, it might be columns of trees that are used as part of a retaining wall. If you're out in a meadow, um, maybe simply the siding, uh, a retaining wall is faced with the siding of your home, so at least it blends in with something there. Berms. You've all seen berms probably out in the landscape that look like somebody backed a dump truck up and just dumped a pile of dirt there. That's something we're trying to avoid. What we'd rather see is a warped plain that rises out of the meadow and maybe it has a short fence on the top. Maybe you're using that berm, uh, for example, as screen parking or something like that. There can be very successful solutions using berms, but you have to be real careful about how they're designed. So they look like a natural form in the landscape, rather than something that is contrived. Another thing we look for is not defining lot lines. Uh, and again, that goes along with how you pattern plants in the landscape. That's something you should try to avoid. And one of the biggest issues here is, has to do with views. One of the things we look very closely at these days is how is this landscape going to perform over time? Is it going to grow up and block somebody's view? Are, are you suggesting trees that are going to grow to a scale that will do that? And you'll likely not get approval for that. There are plant materials that can grow to a certain height that can achieve a, a, a certain purpose that, are, that will satisfy your needs in terms of privacy screener and wind screening, but won't won't overpower the landscape and, and grow to block views. Um, and probably the last thing I'll mention here is, is has to do with fuel management. You have to think about what you're planting as well in terms of fuel management, not only in terms of the species you use, but how you pattern them in the landscape, making sure that there's separation between clusters of plants um, so you're not creating a continuity, a horizontal continuity continuity of fuel that might compromise uh, fuel management practices. Well, I think that's all I have to offer at this time, but I certainly will be open to questions like everybody else. Thank you, Bill. I'm going to uh, remind you about our handouts and the zoning, but I uh, thought I would throw in a little uh, story about one of the things that happened to me when I first moved here. I. Uh, I am into gardening, I really like gardening a lot, and I did have somewhat of an idea of what the restrictions were here, but I wasn't, uh, I haven't read everything thoroughly. Anyway, my house had too much of an upright look, too stark a look to me, so I bought a couple of the large uh, half wine casts and figured I'd put something in front of my house, not realizing that even this in a container in front of the house should have met with approval. 
And I went out and bought some roadies. I figured, well, roadies spit in the forest. They'll be fine. Well, not knowing what I was doing, I bought bright red blooming rhododendrons. And I put them in. And then shortly thereafter, of course, luckily they only bloom once a year, so I only had to feel guilty once a year. <laughs> the more I learned about what I should not have done, the worse I felt every time the poor things bloomed. <laughs> and they did wonderfully. So what I finally decided to do, I just couldn't deal with this anymore. So I donated them to the Del Mar Garden, and they're now happily living here in the historic garden. And I went out and got a couple of ribies, uh, nice and uh, proper pink ribies, and put them in, and they're doing fine. Okay, um, I want to stress before I turn things back to Lori to introduce the uh, someone from the VIP committee. All of what we're talking about, especially the zone maps and finding your plants for your zone. All of this is going to be on our website. The VIP committee is working on a landscape manual and they're working on getting this information online. And I believe some of it is already there. So Lori will be uh, introducing that speaker. But temporarily, we're using the zone maps that Bill uses in his office. And that's what we have back there where Roz and Cecilia are sitting. So on the break and afterwards, if you want to have them help you find your zone, what we have then for your zone is a nice list of the plants that are in that zone in the demonstration garden. Now, we haven't just listed the plants. We've listed what they are and how they behave and how you take care of them. So there's a lot of information on these. And also talks about fire resistancy, fire retardancy, which I forgot to mention earlier, and uh, deer resistancy. Now these are two interesting items. How many of you have purchased a plant um, asking if it was deer resistant? And you've been told, yes, it's deer resistant. Was it really? There are, there are very, very few plants that are really deer resistant. Uh, the Salal is one that is. That's one of the few. And even if you have a plant like the yarrow, which the deer will not eat the yarrow leaves, but what happens when the plant blooms? Well then, chomp, chomp, there go all your blossoms. And we found this in the demo garden with the sea thrift. The sea thrift, which there's one in the back, has the cute little pink pom-poms. As soon as they're up, nice and bright, the next day they're gone. Amazing. So the deer might not eat the plants, but they will eat the blossoms. Now, you can buy what's called deer guard, or tree guard, tree guard. And if you spray, spray the plant about every um, couple of months, even in the winter time. That will keep the deer from eating those plants. The other thing we have discovered is uh, blood meal. Blood meal, which is a nitrogen fertilizer. If you sprinkle that around the edge of the plant, the deer will stay away. They do not like the scent of that. So that's another way. Now, as far as fire-resistant plants, We've done some research. There's a lot of information online. Unfortunately, the information is not very consistent. Um, very few plants will stop a hot fire. I mean, it could be a nice water green ground cover, and the fire, believe me, will go right through it. So the best thing you can do in terms of uh, fire prevention is clean up. Make sure you cut the dead fronds off your sword ferns. And believe it or not, Sonoma County, if you haven't experienced this yet, they are sending out inspectors to look at your property. And you pass or fail. And if you fail, they'll come back and look again after you've done the work. And one of the things in my forest area they're asking people to do is cut all the dead fronds off their sword ferns. And luckily, that's something I've just always done, so I didn't have a problem. My neighbor's out there last weekend cutting all his fronds off. All right, Lori? I want to thank the, the panel so far for giving an overview of uh, native plantings at the Sea Ranch. Um, I've asked John Raymond, who's with the the VIP committee to talk about upcoming uh, attractions on the website. So John, if you could just give us a brief um, talk and then we will uh, be 
breaking uh, for a few minutes. And I think I'm going to have a longer break since we'll be done a little early and that will give you more time to uh, go ahead and find out your plant zone and pick up your, your plant um, a list for your zone and then we will return for the panel to answer questions. And now here's John Raymond. Thank you. Um, the VIP committee and Lord Miller had uh, a vision of providing easier access to landscape information, um, both from brochures and the internet. And fortunately, uh, Nancy's garden and this forum provided a stimulus to uh, move ahead on that and have a, a date where we could have something. So as of 7 o'clock this morning, there are some additions, not a lot, but at the beginning, uh, on the internet site, and uh, you heard Lynn describe where you can go find the uh, list of indigenous and naturalized species. So you go to the tsa.org, and on the left side, there's a list of links, and you go down to the collection called Other Information, which is near the bottom. You click on the link called Environment, and you get a list of additional links. One of those links is the list of plants, but it's not clear necessarily, unless you come to a forum like this, you go to the DCEN and pull out the 30, 35 year old loose leaf binder with maps in it, where, where you are. So we've added two things. One is a description of the zones, uh, very similar to what Lynn presented. Uh, so that's, you can find that by clicking on a link that was already there, uh, policy, uh, and then you go down and at the end of what used to be there is now vegetation description and that has descriptions for the six zones and then below that unfortunately right now with the same title is the beginning of a list of all the lots in the sea range now it's only the beginning like uh, I, I feel I, I've just gone through the, the design process and I'm about to uh, start on the house and that little stone turns out to be a 20 by 40 foot boulder on the ground so the, the list was a little long, and Craig Schwann, who's uh, doing some work in this, is going to work with me to figure out how we can get there. Right now, we only have units one, two, three, and three on there. Um, but we hope to get most of them. What you'll be able to do is go, if you're, right now, if you're in one of those units, go find your lot, and next to it will be the zone for your lot. And you can click on that vegetation zone, and that will take you to that list of indigenous and naturalized species. So that's where we are now. What we hope to do is within a week or two get the complete list of 2,300 different lots and then we'll move on to the next stage which is going to that plant list and formalizing some of the information here so that you'll be able to click on a particular plant and you get a page of information on that. So this is the beginning, it's a work in progress, but at least we've uh, started and hopefully it'll be easier and easier as you go along. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. And I wanted to mention the, the plant sheet he's talking about will have a colored picture, uh, hopefully for each plant, and um, a fuller description of its uh, light requirements and those types of things, uh, similar to a sunset guide type of thing. And at some point we'll be looking for volunteer f photographers or people who can say where you can find a corn lily and um, so that we can get pictures uh, to show you what it will look like. Of course, the best thing is to go to the demonstration garden uh, and see it in person, uh, but uh, it's that the demonstration garden is just getting started and it will take a while for the plants to to really, uh, some of the plants to be of a size where you really can get a feel for what the plant will look like in your garden. Um, with, uh, with that, we're going to break now. It's only 20 to 4, which does give us some time to go back to the um, table on the left there and you can find your zone and you can walk away with the plant list. And on the back table, there's information uh, about uh, where you can get nursery, uh, nurseries where you can get the plants uh, and a sample planting plan. Anyway, browse around and, and uh, I will call the meeting back to order around uh, 4 o'clock for questions um, from uh, the panel.
him. Thank you. So 
That's perhaps why it's on the, the list. The list is also missing, I think, some natives as well. The list is also missing some natives as well. We've, uh, over the years, we've found a number of, of plants that aren't on the list that grow here naturally. And we're going to be looking at talking to the design committee. The staff is looking at talking to the design committee and presenting them with a revised, updated native, quote unquote, native plant list. There was a tree on the plant list when I first got here, the Monterey pine, which again is not indigenous to this area, and it was taken off the list because of, of the problems it has. So um, that's a good question, and I don't have a full answer for you. What defines the native? We have a lot of non-natives out there, and this is especially true with uh, grasses. Most of our most of the grasslands out there are not native today. Does that answer your question? Well, yeah. How about, for example, on the, on the for example, on the bluff tops, some of the the washes of flowers that we get in the spring are those natives? Yeah, mostly. It that's the one area of the sea ranch that that has stayed as mostly native plants. And I think it's because it's such an extreme environment that a lot of non-native species could, didn't adapt to that. Whereas they did adapt to our terraces, they didn't adapt to the bluff edge. So a lot of the wildflower displays that you see on the bluff edge are truly native plants. Including the ice plant? No. <laughs> but it all depends on how you define native there. Because, um, some people will argue that uh, much of the ice plant that you see on the coast all around the world, maybe they originated in South Africa, but as a natural process of floating on, on you know, driftwood, etc., and landing on another shore, they became, that's so, so the way plants spread. So is that native? Uh, you know, you can argue. I can only think of real right off the bat two true natives in North America. And that's the sunflower and the cranberry. <laughs> Seriously. And I think there may be one other I can't remember, but North America. So no. How do you define native? <laughs> it's something we you know, it's a big world and we're joined at one time with other continents, so maybe you really want to get technical. <coughs> I, I, you know, I'm not sure. What's the most recent? Uh, what was the book that came after mine? It's slipping. Um, it must be laying my hand. She, I couldn't hear what you said. Uh, what was the book that came after mine? Jepson. 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 Yeah, you know, there's the authority. I would look to that. And if, if uh, the plant is listed for this area, then I would say it's a native. But there is a lot of debate about it. There is. I might actually add one thing that I think you would probably agree with, Bill, is that native is contextual to your neighborhood too. Really, would, when you when it comes to actually landscaping, your native list might identify things that you don't see in your neighborhood. But um, the more the most appropriate, what I try when I'm meeting with clients is look at what is growing in that person's neighborhood. What is successful? What is going to do what we need to do, and, and take that cue as a native pointer in developing landscaping plans. There's different scales of what native is. Right. Do we have more questions? Yeah. Rod, why don't you follow him? If one were to plant an improved tree, uh, what are the uh, constraints then as it grows? Do you have to keep it at a certain height? And uh, then the other part of the question, existing trees that are already too high and are blocking the view, what can one do about that? That's a, that's a really complex, complex issue and I'll try to take it in, in parts. If, 
If you want to plant a tree, um, it depends on where you are, I, I think, on the ranch as to whether or not it would be approved. If you're out in the middle of the meadow, a tree is probably not appropriate there. The short pine might be if it's managed. And if it's planted vegetation, you are required to make, maintain it within the height limit of the lot. If you're planting a tree and you live up in the woods, uh, it wouldn't be appropriate to let it grow to the height limit of the house and then chop it off. Because what you want that tree to do is look like the rest of the neighborhood, which might be 120 feet tall. So that's where the rule would not be applied. Um, and the rule applies to what we call owner planted vegetation, and that's vegetation that we can identify as being on a planting plan that somebody has submitted. And back in the early days, oftentimes uh, uh, planting plans were not submitted, and therefore we have landscapes out there that we don't have any planting plan for. And and it is a problem sometimes in getting people to comply with the height limit because um, they can argue, well, gee, I didn't plant these trees, and they probably didn't. The two previous owners did, so they don't know how the trees got there. So it's hard for us to argue that the trees weren't <coughs> planted. Sometimes it's pretty obvious, and other times it's not so obvious. Um, also, the rule regarding the height limit of planted vegetation was not adopted till 1971. And so, technically, trees planted before that time are not subject to the height limit. And other trees that were planted, for example, by the developer are not subject to that, or not subject to the height limit, or a tree that naturalizes is not subject. And we all see what nature does out there. They're constantly planting trees. So sometimes it's really hard to determine whether or not somebody planted a tree or nature planted a tree. It's a, it's a very difficult issue for us to deal with. If, if there are trees that are blocking a new corridor for maybe several homes, uh, is there not a procedure to at least ask a lot owner where the trees are and others to uh, come to some reasonable uh, condition for the height of the tree? Yeah, there is a process for that, for dealing with that, that you as an owner can apply for vegetation removal on your own lot, on your neighbor's lot, or the common. Uh, another question I had was, you, you talked about uh, approved uh, landscaping in the, I think, front of the house was the term used. Uh, what's considered a, a, a private area for planting? Okay, that, that would be an enclosed courtyard, for example. If you have at your entry to your home an enclosed courtyard that's fenced in, you can do just about anything you want in there, except plant something that's non-native that goes grows more than six feet in height. Is so, that native? Um, not necessarily. I, I think it's more an issue of is it in the public view, and, and I think that's the determining factor. How visible is it? Uh, for example, the design committee has never minded a little blast of exotic color right say right at the the entry to your home it's almost like if you think of a nightlight at night that guides you where you're supposed to go well, that little blast of exotic color can do the same thing during the daytime mm -hmm. so but in generally speaking speaking uh, you know anything that can be seen from the public from commons from neighbors should be native species but you are allowed, and you're not required to submit a planting plan for those, for areas inside the courtyard. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I, I was asked a question back at the table back there. Does the association have, or will they have, a list of approved landscape designers who will design people's gardens that are either qualified or specializing in native plants, because we have our one on the panel here, which is the only one I could recommend, they said, <laughs> will there be a list today? <laughs> and I said, well, I really don't know. <laughs> 
we do have a list of, of uh, landscape architects, of which there are, pardon me? They don't necessarily have to be architects, they can be designers. Right, landscape architects, designers, and contractors. Many of the contractors here also do design work. But they, do they specialize in California natives? Uh, I, I, I think they specialize in in gardens in general, and uh, you know, since they they work in other places besides the sea ranch, you know, I think a lot of the local contractors certainly know their natives because simply because of the sea ranch, they wouldn't need to know them perhaps if it wasn't for the sea ranch, but a lot of them do know their natives. Could I ask a question? So I still operate this. Have you ever thought about running a uh, a training course for the local gardeners on native plants? You know, for example, Scott actually just did some work for us, but the the gentleman who planted it wouldn't have known about this because he's not on the Sea Ranch listserv. And uh, you know, maybe you need to reach out to all the gardeners in the area and have a have this type of a forum with the gardeners. This has, that has come up, and yes, we would like to do, it's something more likely to happen next year rather than this year, but we do have a problem with just the maintenance aspect of it, of uh, the maintenance workers cutting the grass too short so it looks like a lawn, and actually the maintenance workers encouraging people to fertilize and water their lawns, or I shouldn't say lawns, their grass. Uh, the other problem is we actually have lands, um, Gardeners who are sculpting the plants, creating what are they called? Topiary. Topiary. <laughs> that is not appropriate on Sea Ranch. That is not okay, but we have it happening. So, yes, the answer to your question is we do plan to do that. That came up at the VIP committee, and it's come up in our group also. Could they get a little plaque or something saying that they're Sea Ranch? Great. Well, no, maybe not approved, but so that when people look, you could ask, do you have the Sea Ranch certification? I'll, I'll look into that, whether we can issue a, a little certificate that they attended the course. Yes. Yeah. Now, while well, I've got the mic back, I've got one more little story to tell you, and I'm going to talk briefly about the approved of uh, this list. Uh, this is a freebie. I live in the forest area, and if you take a pot with nice, rich soil in it, maybe water it once in a while, just put it out in your yard, your patio, that's what will happen. <laughs> it grows ferns. And in fact, to show you how, how natives can take over, inside my enclosed patio, I've got uh, a couple non-natives, not many, about two left. These guys are taking over. They actually move into the plant with the non-native, and move into the pot with the non-native, and they just kick out the non-native. So it's rather amusing to watch. But anyway, free ferns. Just put some dirt out there. OK. Um, to clarify a little more about our list from the Devil Garden, I really didn't explain well how this came about. Now, I started with the four zones we could fit into the demonstration garden, because we could not fit all six zones into a less than an acre plot. So we started with the four zones we were going to use. We looked at the official list of indigenous plants. And then there's another list that consultants used when they were replanting the Winthrow areas. And some of those plants are in addition to the ones on uh, the list of indigenous plants. So we added some of those to this with the approval of the design department. And then I got information from the local native plant chapter. They are interested in what we're doing here. And they had a lot to say about our plant list, things they didn't like that were on the list, things that they wanted on the list that were not on there. So I looked at everything they sent me, and so this list is a composite of more than one plant list, all with approval, and information from the local native plant people to uh, comply with what they wanted. So this list that you're seeing of what's in the demo garden does not match directly the list of indigenous plants. 
Someday maybe they'll become closer as we work on that other list. And this is a follow-up uh, question to that. Since we don't have, you know, we have more than one list floating around, is it fairly safe? I'm asking Bill, probably putting him on the spot. You know, if you use any of these lists, that those would be approved, most likely approved in a plan that was submitted. If, if you're making an application, then we'll review it. And I guess that's the best thing I can say. But if somebody came in with a plant that wasn't specifically on yeah. one list or another, if it was appropriate for the zone? There, there is flexibility with, within the, the zones and the list themselves. So you really need to look at, uh, you really, again, need to look at each individual property in its own context and make decisions based on that. I think that's the best thing you can say. The same when you build a house. It's about how that particular house fits that setting. Same with plant material. Are there any more questions? Well, I think then we, we will. Um, uh, uh, I wanted to say a brief uh, thing about next um, month's forum. And I don't have my sheet of paper with me, but um, it will be a personal perspective um, on community organizations uh, presented by John Fox, our community manager. Uh, he's going to be talking about local governments and in particular community associations such as the Sea Ranch. That's going to be on August 12th. The date has been changed from our normal first Saturday to the second Saturday. It will be on August 12th from 3 to 5. Um, and uh, there's going to be a wedding the first, first week, so we defer to that schedule. Um, and with that, we conclude today's forum and would like to again thank the panel for their information and the, the many materials that they have provided for us today.